There's a certain communion hospitality workers share from years in the trenches of sweat, stale beers, scars, and filthy dishes. Cooking is the worst job in the world. All while satiating the appetite of the gluttonous masses. Working in a professional kitchen, it sucks. This here is Kevin Cherkis, chef and owner of Kuka, a dream that was nearly destroyed by the pandemic. And while I've been bartending for 26 years, not cooking, it's still all one big, over-energetic, masochistic family. Like I'm super overwhelming. I love cooking, Kevin. With energy to everybody. I like making cookies and muffins for my friends. A shared love for pain and chaos. Industry, energy is is what you need to get through you every survive. day. No, you can't. Making cookies for your friends has nothing to do with working in a professional kitchen. The adrenaline is addicting. We would all wake up every morning with this fear. For me, coffee, this, that, all the other products, I've never needed any of them. Just waiting for the daunting day that lies ahead. I can imagine you want to pay. Yeah, can you imagine what that would be like? Yeah, yeah, yeah. (laughs) Sounds like a lot of fun, right? Bro. I'm certain that I couldn't get up, do my eight to five, you work through the things you have to do, you clock out. That's tough, huh? couldn't do it. It's really tough, eh? Hospitality, period, it sucks. That little yeah, the comfort is zone. Yeah, the, and that people need that, yeah. eh? Well, I think we do too. This is just our comfort zone is fucked up. Yeah, that's <laughs> well said. Get out while you still can, young sprout. So we figured we'd give you a little glimpse into the madness. I know, I know, we promised you we'd show you Thailand, but due to being delayed in Egypt for five extra days and trapped in the Istanbul airport for three days, our 10 days in Bangkok were reduced to a two-day layover. So this is pretty much all you get. Too fast? We agree. But we had plane tickets to the pristine beaches, lush jungles, and cascading waterfalls of Bali. After all the stress of the last couple of weeks, it was finally time for some quiet introspection and peaceful self-healing. Changu was described to us as a chill surf village that had yet to be fully overrun by partying tourists. Something like that. That information seems to be a bit out of date. So we jumped on the bike to seek out Pama Waters. One of the joys of a life in hospitality is that it's a family, one that crosses land and sea. So when JP, the executive chef from one of my last New York City hospitality gigs, heard we were heading to Bali, he insisted we look up another of our ilk. Kevin is the chef and owner of a culinary paradise nestled in an old coconut grove in the sleepy little fisherman's village of Jimbaran, where we had one of the most beautiful, mouth-watering meals of our life. Are you gonna ruin my palate? <laughs> no. The rest of my trip to Indonesia? Yeah, yes, yes. Yeah, yeah you are. <laughs> yes. Yeah. So let's talk for a moment a little bit about delicious. Everything can be grabbed direct from soil to restaurant in four hours. Like we have a few people that when we order cauliflower are going to the dude and they're cutting cauliflower and they're throwing it into a bag and it's dirty and it's full of bugs and it's full of leaves and it's fucking ugly. And when they bring it here, it's actually cauliflower. It smells like cauliflower, it tastes like cauliflower and it's delicious. How did you end up getting into it? Cooking? Yeah. I always loved eating logs. So obviously I'm a chef. I was a very odd kid with meal periods. Like I was very excited for food. When you go downstairs for breakfast and you say, what's for breakfast? Whatever that answer was would be, my, my reaction was always overwhelmingly positive. Like if you said pancakes, I'm like, yum. Like, <laughs> oh my God, pancakes. Like whatever that answer would be, oatmeal, pancakes, toast. I'm like, I love toast. Like I was drawn towards any individual that could cook well, because my mother can't, she's Irish and the food is horrid. And so I would get really good at timing, knocking on the doors at friends' places <laughs> during meal periods. Sorry, Kevin, we're just eating breakfast now. Oh, breakfast, awesome, what are you having? They'll be like, 
yeah, I uh, just sat down at the table and be like, oh, delicious. And be like, have, have, have you had breakfast, Kevin? No, no breakfast. And I would self-invite myself all the time. I became really famous for it. I love the chaos and the madness and the intensity that is a world-class kitchen. I've been drawn to it since I was 15. And then high school was tough for me because I couldn't sit still in school. I was basically failing the majority of, of classes in high school. And I just decided I would no longer go. So then the culinary arts program, which was the cafeteria, sure. it was a giant kind of Ukrainian, big, you know, Santa Claus looking dude. And so I just spent all my time in culinary arts. And we used to make all the food for the entire school of 500 kids. And he saw my energy as a solution to this massive task of creating food for 500 people. And I saw him as an amazing guy that saw potential where no other teacher did. And so he gave me scholarship to culinary school. 21, I left. I worked in New York for three years. No, uh, I saw you worked with Daniel. Yeah, I worked with Daniel. Good, uh, yeah. Now, Daniel is an interesting character. He's kind of like the French version of Batman. He's nowhere to be found until the moment you make a mistake and he's standing right bloody behind you. Before landing in Bali, Kevin cooked in Spain, was the chef de cuisine in Shangri-La in Malaysia, and was eventually offered a job as their executive chef in Singapore. And everyone was happy about it except me, and I thought, yeah, I, I still have this dream of opening up my own business and going back to the stoves, but you need someone that can do everything else. Like people think a restaurant is a chef and actually a chef is like 10% of what a restaurant, because it's a business. Like you need marketing and branding and payroll and finance and graphic design and human resources and like all of them. Through total coincidence, my wife that I had met and I dearly loved at the time that I never saw, was working as a director of a school and she's a business girl. And I thought, wait a minute, you can kind of do all those things. And yeah, she's the greatest person in the world. She's the smartest person I've ever met. Her superpower is decision-making. It is sick how she makes decisions. <laughs> like, and it takes her no time, like left or right, right. And you're like, how does it make, how do you know that? And so I started whittling her down with the idea of what if we open up a restaurant one day? And she was not into it at all. To resign, at that stage was financial suicide and going into this unknown of building a restaurant with no sign of success. And the only draw to make it all happen was working with you every day is the only way we're ever gonna see each other because every year was getting worse. You've got your life and then you've got work and you never do this. Like I would wake up when she was sleeping and I would get home at night when she was there and we'd have a dinner and we'd go to bed. You basically just work. So I just thought, what if we try? And if it fails miserably, at least we try. Uh, and I didn't want to die thinking what would have happened. So we thought, fuck it, let's give it a try. And so we just started building like two idiots. We found this coconut grove in the middle of nowhere and our heart said, this is perfect. Nothing in the world comes for free. And nobody came, like nobody came. Like everyone's like, dude, your food's weird. This doesn't make sense because it was super opinionated and quirky and it had lots of personality. And they're like, but how do you even explain this? Like, why don't you do pizza and pasta? Why don't you do steaks or burgers? Like, why don't you do something that makes sense? And we're just like, yeah. Like, I prefer to fail miserably at doing something we believe in than succeed in doing something that everyone else is already doing. So this is a unique challenge for a restaurant to have. So what we did is we just thought, let's just go back. Let's just go back 50, 60 years and go back to old school hospitality where everyone who shows up, you just actually give a shit. Like you go there and with your heart on your sleeve, you say, hey, what's up? Where are you from? What are you looking for? How do we make this a great experience for you? And you're there. So when they leave, they leave with a feeling of eating in a family restaurant where they actually supported your business and you're there and you care. And that's what we did. From two guests, it became four. From four, it became eight. From eight, it became 16. We just slowly started to grow. Within three years, we were really busy. And we were like, oh my God, like it's, it's fucking happened. And like at year six, seven, eight, you couldn't get a seat in the place. And it was like the most unbelievable feeling to come to work every day and look around and the restaurant is packed. And then COVID came 
and just destroyed us. And we had to make a decision, do we just close and send everybody home or what do we do? Survival, yeah, survival. And we thought, listen, the team are so important to us and they've been with us for so long. Let's just keep paying. Everybody gets half salaries and everybody gets paid and we just keep coming along. And in a few months, hopefully business comes back. It wasn't a few months. No, it was not. It was two goddamn years and we just fought every day and we had the same mentality as we did when we opened. Let's just keep doing it with integrity. Let's just keep doing it 100%. And when the money runs out, we just say, at least we fucking try. We knew we had to create. This was our moment. So like the first eight months, like March 2020, when nobody came, we just cooked food. Because I knew it. Like I knew cooking and I knew the ingredients and I knew the kitchen and I knew, I knew the feel of the stoves and the knives. And it just, like there was some level of comfort in in the chaos that was around us. And we were developing dishes that were kick-ass. And we thought, but maybe we never get to serve it. We're never gonna come back. The business is gonna close and this is it. Like, Did you ever think, you know what, let's just shut it every down? Day. Every day, every day, every day we just woke up in the morning and we tried to find some glimmer of hope to get out of bed and keep pushing through. I've always believed that it's not about being good, it's not about being smarter, it's not about being better or more talented. I just thought our will to succeed just needs to be stronger than everybody else who wants us to fail. And that's exactly what we did in KUKA. We demanded to drive our own highway and do everything ourselves. COVID has got to get tired, no? So mm -hmm. just keep it coming and eventually I'll still have enough energy to fight every day and the business will come back. And my God, it did. Like, yeah, it's a fairy tale, dude. Man, you get the patience of a saint yeah. and the decision-making of, of a damn good life. <laughs> yeah. Giving up on your dream, if you give up on your dream easily, like you're a bitch. Like, I don't know how else to say it, but you're a bitch. Like, there's got to be something we're fighting for. Yeah. Like your family, like, you're in, like, like you, like your integrity as a human being, like your beliefs, like there's got to be something worth fighting for. And if you just are okay with losing whatever you believe in in life, what a horrible life that would be. So we just didn't. I don't think a lot of people realize that their story is interesting. Yeah. I really don't. I think a lot of people think I'm not interesting. Yeah. I'm just kind of going through my day. Things are frustrating. I don't have time. Yeah. And but the thing is, they're not looking at their life from the outside. I, I understand completely. Somehow in explaining my story, it also gives me healing. You know what I mean? Like saying all of that, like I even feel emotional because getting that shit out makes me, yeah, it's a lot. It. Following your dream is rarely easy. Cooking is the worst job in the world as close to this business as possible is where I feel the most comfort. Unless you love it. As I get farther away from this restaurant, I get more nervous about the outcome of every day. And me, I absolutely love it. As long as I'm here and I'm only worried about food and my wife is making all the decisions, <laughs> I feel like everything is gonna be okay. Thanks to all of you for joining Kevin from Kuka in Bali. See you soon. Here's to you, my fellow masochist. Thank you for making your dreams delicious.